Sure, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for tonight's talk, Interstices Towards a Decolonial Transpoetics of the Future uh, by multimedia artist and writer, Kamala Mackerel. My name is Blair Fornwald and I'm the director curator of the School of Art Gallery. For those who may be listening only, I am a white femme in my early forties with a short brown bob sure. haircut. Um, Can I guess hi, everyone. a septum ring? Ooh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from the lab. Um, I've got one dangly earring and I'm wearing a black turtleneck and a jean jacket. And I'm speaking to you from my kitchen in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I have a cute array of colorful artworks behind me. Although we are gathered virtually, this talk is presented by the School of Art Gallery at the University of Manitoba, which is on Treaty 1 territory. This is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Signed in 1871, Treaty 1 took territory from seven Anishinaabe First Nations to make the land available for settler use and ownership. As a preface to tonight's talk, perhaps we might reflect on the local instances of what Lemaigre refers to as ancestral loss, the loss of bodies, histories, cultures, languages, genders, knowledge systems, and spiritual practices. How can the work that we do as individuals and organizations begin to address the harms of the past and trouble the systems that uphold power and perpetuate these losses into the present and future? Land acknowledgements are not, of course, constitutive of such change, but they remind us that such change is imperative and that we must dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Wherever you're joining us from, I would ask that you take a moment to consider the land that you're on and your relationship to it and to its original stewards. There's also in the chat, a link to a really beautiful open source resource called nativeland.ca. And if you take a look at that, you can learn more about traditional and treaty and indigenous language communities that exist worldwide. It's, it's a lovely resource and um, do spend time with it if you're inclined. I would also like to acknowledge that the School of Art Gallery is generously supported by the University of Manitoba by the School of Arts faculty and staff, and by donors and volunteers. Our programming is also supported by national and provincial funding agencies. And I am particularly thankful for the support of the School of Art Gallery staff, Donna Jones, C.W. Brooks, Jane Gorbridge, and Casper Stein. Huge thanks also to our former work study student, C.L. Cottle, who was really instrumental in getting this speaker series up and running and who introduced, introduced me to the work of Kamala Mackerel. Um, I am also very grateful to the School of Art Galleries or to the School of Arts Media and Events Coordinator, Kaylin Harrison, who helps run these virtual events and, and promotes them. She's wonderful. And of course, we are also extremely grateful to Kamala Mackerel for making time to speak with us tonight. Kama is a Mauritian multi, multidisciplinary artist, educator, cultural mediator, writer, and literary translator who lives and loves in Jojoge, Montreal, Canada. Uh, tonight, they will talk about their use of interdisciplinary artistic practices as hybrid spaces from which they enunciate decolonial vocabularies of the queer and trans self. Drawing from their body of work in poetry, photography, video, installation, and performance, and from artists and thinkers who have influenced their work, they will demonstrate how intermedia spaces can provide a, a site for new strategies of selfhood, representation, kinship, and resistance. Before I turn it over to Kama, I would like to introduce you, or in, in, ugh, <laughs> I would like to encourage you, if you live in Winnipeg, uh, to make an appointment to visit our exhibitions, which are open until May 13th. A Story in the Middle features work by Catherine Blackburn, Lucian Dury, Melanie Monaceros and Audie Murray, and it explores the ways that love and grief inhabit handmade and handed down objects. Kiaf Batty's Night Garden is a really poignant single channel video about mortality, love, and the comforts of home. And Cause to Become, which is curated by the School of Art Gallery's Young Canada Works outgoing intern, Christina Hajar, features works by Wes Harmon, Mariana Munoz Gomez, Florence Yee, and Hagera Salam. Zike Gebrehewat, and it explores the aesthetic practices of queer diasporas. No matter where you're located, I would invite you to visit Ciel Cottle's exhibition Pause, Protest, Activism, Whimsy, and Self-Care in Animal Crossing, 
which is up in animal processing until May 7th. And to join us on Zoom or YouTube Live for a reading by Mariana Munoz Gomez on May 6th. You can find out how to attend those events on our website. And finally, um, the housekeeping portion. I would like to remind everyone that this talk is being recorded and it will also be live streamed on YouTube Live. So um, hi everyone on YouTube Live. Um, I see you, thanks for coming. Um, I'm also reminding you to make sure that your audio is muted, um, which it seems you are all muted. Um, we have ASL interpreters available for this talk. Their names are Cindy and Christina, and we are very grateful for their services. Um, we also have live transcription available, which you can turn on or off by clicking on the CC live transcript button at the bottom panel. You can also move that, that block of text around on the screen so you can, you can put it someplace convenient if you'd like. If you have any questions throughout the talk, um, you can type them into the chat box um, throughout the talk and uh, Kemma will answer them at the end. Or you can hold your questions until the end and, and, and ask them with your voice or the chat. Um, but uh, that, that's how that is going to go. We will also be collecting questions um, over on YouTube and delivering them here uh, to Zoom. So feel free to ask your questions in the YouTube chat if you would like. And I think that's all from me. Um, so now without further ado, please welcome tonight's speaker, Kamala Mackerel. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Blair, <clears throat> for such a generous introduction. Uh, so I, uh, I am a mixed race, black, brown, trans femme uh, wearing uh, a blue shirt and dangling earrings and uh, with a little bit of a beard and thick black curly hair that's spreading pretty much into half the screen. <laughs> and in the background, uh, there are some of my plants. I'm actually in my living room um, and I have a lot of plants that keep me company. And in the background, there are uh, some plants uh, that you can see uh, through the screen. I mean, for those of you um, who might not be, um, who might be joining only uh, orally uh, into this, um, uh, this talk. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, it, it's such a delight really, it, 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 it's such a, a privilege to get to share this space and this moment uh, with all of you. I come to you today from Dejage, uh, which is also known as Montreal in colonial terms, uh, which is the traditional territories of the Kanyagihaga. And uh, I do want to start by extending my gratitude, extending my gratitude to these territories, extending my gratitude to those lands, extending my gratitude to those lands that give me the food that I eat, that give me the water that I drink, that give me the oxygen that I, I breathe. Um, and I think it's important. One of the questions that I, 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 I like to ask myself is what is what makes our lives possible? What is it that makes whatever it is that we're doing in this case, in this moment, what makes me being able to give this talk? What makes this possible? And the, my first reflection is always we need to think about the land because it's the land that gives us food and oxygen and water and those basic needs as human beings. So I, I do I think it's very important to think about our relationship to the lands and the territories where we each live, wherever it is that we might be joining today. Uh, and to think about that history, right? Like is that those lands actually have a long, long history. Those lands have traditional keepers who long before any of us settlers were here, who actually tendered to those territories and cared for those territories from generation to generations. And now we get to benefit from those from those resources, except those traditional peoples have been displaced uh, in many cases or do not have access or have been, or those are populations that have been eradicated. Um, and I think it is our responsibility uh, to, to think just as human beings living on those territories, it is our responsibility to, to think about our relationship to the land. So, so I do want to start by um, extending not only my gratitude, uh, but also, you know, putting putting to the front my, my responsibility um, as a settler who is benefiting from the resources, from the territories where I live. Um, 
And I encourage, I encourage um, every single one of us to, to think through those questions of, I'm going to be talking about decolonization a lot, mostly within a Mauritian context, which is the, you know, like in terms of my own personal history, uh, but, you know, decolonization as, as a process, as, as, as a way of making, as a way of thinking is a continuous ongoing process that I think every single one of us need to think through in terms of what it means uh, to us. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it in terms of how it relates to my artwork within the history of Mauritius and my ancestries, but that does not, um, you know, um, it, I still have by the sheer fact of living on those territories. Like I think also thinking for like the, the, the multiple ways in which colonial history was is interlinked and the multiple forms of oppressions that came from that. So I think it, it's very important for us to, 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 to reckon with those questions. Um, so um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, also thank you for, um, for, for creating also, um, you know, an online event that could be as accessible as possible. Um, that's something that's always like meaningful uh, to me. So thank you, Cindy and Christina, who are our interpreters here. Uh, and also thank you, I'm glad we have, we also have live captioning and, and um, yeah, it's, uh, thank you to everyone for, for making this event happen in this way. Um, so what I'm going to do today uh, is I'm going to start first. I'm going to be reading you a piece from Zomfam. Zomfam is my debut poetry collection that came out in September of 2020. And I'm going to start, I'm going to read a piece for you today. And the piece that I'm reading is actually the piece um, where you, we get the title, where the title Zomfam comes from. So I'm going to be reading the piece Zomfam, and then from there I'm going to unpack the process of, of the creative process that went into this work as a book, but this work is also a show, and how that relates then to my textile work and my visual arts, and what are the interspaces between each of them, and what does each of the spaces allow me as an artist to articulate, and what are the ways in which we can think through a, like a trans poetics and, and decolonial resistance through the space between those arts, those multiple uh, disciplines. Um, so just to say a few words about, about Zomfam, Zomfam was published by Metonymic Press, Press, sorry, uh, which is based here, uh, which is a small queer press, indie press based in Dejage, Montreal. Uh, and so Zomfam is uh, in Creole and it means, uh, it means men, woman or, or transgender or trans femme, if you want. There's no exact translation of it. Uh, um, and, and the, the, the book is comprised of eight poems. There are only eight poems in it because it's, it's actually long lyric poems. Like, and each of them give a story. Um, and it's the story that starts with the birth of this child uh, on the island. And it's, it's the story of the coming of age of this child, um, which is very much based on my own life. Uh, and, you know, as they grappling, growing up on the, on the on sugarcane plantations within the multiple, the multiple forms of colonial silences and how those colonial silences impact their family lives, but also the political context in which the island is. And um, so each of the stories narrate the coming of age as, of this child as they seeking what I call in the book languages of love, um, which are the languages in which within their family, within the context of colonial silences, where they learn to love themselves and also for the family to forgive and love each other. So those, those are the stories, like that's uh, the gist of Zomfam. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read, uh, so the piece, Zomfam uh, for you uh, today. Okay. When I tell my mother that I am trans, her lips wobble a minor tremor, but her silence her silence does not span the three decades of my life. She smiles with compassion. She speaks her golden heart, soft, warm, welcoming. Her eyes cast a resilient glow. 
She does not need to tell me. She does not need to tell me about our history because our lineage is one of silence that we weave in between our intimacies. But her body, her brown, exhausted body speaks of her childhood. I see in her old eyes the grimy streets of portress, grey, dusty, stifling under the burning sun. I see in the drooping ridges around her cheeks the cold embrace of banyan trees when the summer heat became too heavy to bear. I see in the shakiness of her eyelids melted tall, gluing itself to her eight-year-old feet. In the streets of the capital, poverty was a sticky business. Particles of blackness stained the virtuous skin of childhood. I see in my mother's shiny forehead, in the beads of sweat that placed themselves evenly on her skin, a child pushing a cart. Unde putu adu sonso? Unde putu adu sonso? Those sweets that her godmother made diligently with freshly crushed coconut and ground rice and that she push in a cart every single day of her life, all the way from Plain Verde to Cité Saint-Croix. Unde putu adu sonso? Unde putu adu sonso? When I look deep into the battered trenches under my mother's eyes, I see copper coins shifting hands, churchgoers, beggars, children, sex workers, faithful and unfaithful, unwrapping round coconut brown rice sweets from the humidity of newspapers, dipped into hot black tea, an everyday ritual of my mother's childhood in Cité Saint-Croix. When I tell my mother that I am trans, her withered hands shake like dried twigs forgotten by history, but her silence, her silence does not span the three decades of my life. She tells me, Pataka si toi kama, tokoni jimun kuma toi tul tochi nasa. She tells me that we come from a history and a culture where the women, men, and the men, women have always existed. That people like me are present in our myths and our religions, and that for as long as she can remember, vie jimun, the elders. They spoke of the men, women, and the women, men. Her eyes mirror phantom images, lucent narratives line her haunted lips. She whispers into the soles of my feet that she vaguely remembers an old relative who lived close by when she was a child who was, who was in her words, of my kind. But she immediately closes her heart, fetters her lungs, stitches her throat with a filament of concealment. She freds the unspoken between our bodies because our lineage is one of silence that we weave in between our intimacies. But every day since, every day since I dream of my mother's childhood, I dream of this old relative who was of my kind. Sometimes I call him Bajani. Sometimes I call him Devakumar. Sometimes I call her Badet. And sometimes I call her Nila. But most of the time, I like to call her Kumkum. 
I dream of Kumkum with round shoulders, a blood red bindi on her forehead, a glint of gold hanging over the edge of her pointed nose, raven curly hair, a tad too greasy, but that still bounces up and down the nape of her neck as she walks in the morning sun. Kum Kum wears plain cotton kurtas that she haggles in the markets of Plenvet. And if she ever gets invited to a wedding, she adorns herself of her most prized garment, a brocaded red salvar chemise that wraps her rotten body like the heavy skin of syrupy lychee. Kum Kum eats rice dal and pickles during the week, and on weekends she dries, treats herself to some dried salted fish cooked with onions, fresh thyme, and tomatoes. And bon tirogai poisson salé, bien mauricien. And bon tirogai poisson salé, bien mauricien. Kum Kum has a radio set, and she listens to the news and avid odyssey every morning. And Hindi songs every evening. Kum Kum rubs coconut oil in her thick black hair every Friday. Kum Kum has a job. She works in the tobacco factory in the capital city with all the poor women whose husbands had died in obscure wars nobody on the island really knows about fought in a faraway British war and never came back. On her lunch break, Kum Kum does not step out with the other women to roll tobacco in small newspaper pieces that burn their darkened lips. Instead, she stays at her workstation. She sits silently and she prays, she prays, she prays. She prays to Goddess Durgama. She prays for a safe life. She prays for love. She prays for forgiveness. When it gets hot in the capital city, Kum Kum takes out a wide embroidered handkerchief from her purse and wipes the purse of sweat from her forehead. Kum Kum likes flower patterns. Kum Kum loves embroidery. On Sundays, Kum Kum polishes her floors and can broscoco. She brings out her mattress, leans it in the sun against the mango tree and beats it with a stick. She winnows her rice and her lentils for the week. She makes fruit pickles that she dries on her roof. And at the end of the day, she massages her feet with a slick of warm coconut oil. Kum Kum has a lover. But does Kum Kum have a lover? I'm not sure yet whether Kum Kum has a lover, but this is Kum Kum, and I dream about her every day. She draws her life like a moving sculpture, ephemeral, becoming and unbecoming herself with every single one of my dreams. When I tell my mother that I am trans, she does not tell me about Pajani, Devaka, Mop, Badit, or Nila. She does not even tell me about Kum Kum. Instead, my mother tells me that she is an, an educated woman who feels much pride that I went to school, that I can read and write, that I speak English and I speak French. She tells me that because of her lack of education, she does not have the words for it, but she understands that people like me have always existed. She calls me Zumfam, which in our local language means men, woman. I take pleasure in being Zumfam.
a man woman being neither them nor femme, yet being both them and femme, navigating a middle passage between being and becoming, an interstice where migrant bodies like mine find their truth an undefinable, undefinable space that maps the cartography of my skin, a hyphen that holds and wraps my gendered experience. The fans, the fans, the Zoom, fam, zoom, fam. But my mother tells me that I should not call myself zoom fam, that she is an uneducated woman who does not know those things, but that she's happy, she's happy, she's happy, that I have an education, that I can call myself trans, that I have the words, the language to describe the mystification of my gender, the longing to tear off my skin, along with my skin, my birth certificate, my passport, the state sanctioned papers that dictate my gender. But deep inside me, there is a voice that speaks in the uneducated tones of my mother. This voice embroiders itself from paw to paw onto the surface of my skin. There is a voice that does not have the words or the vocabulary, but reverberates goodness and music in my body, my heart beating the drums of my ancestors. There is a voice that did not go to school, does not speak English, does not speak French, and yet echoes wisdom and truth in my bloodstream like the waves of the ocean that witnessed the loss of our languages. That voice tells me that I do not need an imperial language to define myself, that I do not need to be trans in English or in French. Colonialism has already wrapped itself like a knot around my vocal cords. And even though our lineage is one of silence that we weave in between our intimacies, this voice exists deep within and it speaks like my mother, like my grandmother, like my great grandmother, like the generations of women and femmes who fought to keep our language alive and pass it on from generation to generation. So mother, I will listen. I will listen to the voices of our ancestry, femme tongues that dictate that I speak out loud. And when I'm done tearing off my skin, along with my skin, my birth certificate, my passport, the state sanctioned papers that dictate my gender, I will take every single piece of torn skin and paper. I will paint them in gold and put them back together with glistening stars as I so desire. I will build a femme armor, a fierce femme armor that I will celebrate an unbreakable, unshakable object of love that I will hold together with respect and dignity. And I, will call this armor the fam the fam the And I tell my mother that I am trans. 
her lips wobble a minor trill. The silence does not span the three decades of my life. She does not need to tell me. She does not need to tell me about our history because our lineage is one of a secret language. Our lineage is one of a long, lost, secret language that we weave in between our intimacies. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So this was Zomfam, the piece Zomfam from the book Zomfam. Um, uh, the book is available. You can easily order it from any of your local bookstores, uh, wherever you are. Uh, you could also order it online, but um, I would rather you don't order the book from Amazon, but order it from your local bookstore. <laughs> Uh, um, I think I'm starting to say this now, like just out loud, like just don't order my book on Amazon. Please order it from your local bookstore. Uh, but also if I may say, um, if you, uh, I, I do, I, I will talk about like why I encourage you to buy the book because there are certain things that I think is interesting as an object to hold uh, in a moment. But also um, if you can't uh, also feel free, I encourage you also to, ask your local libraries, your university libraries, your school libraries to also order the book because then you can always borrow it and you don't have to spend money on it. Uh, but also this is just launching a book during a pandemic has been such a nightmare. And I think one of the very concrete ways in which we can support artists and writers at, at present is really making sure that either we order their books or we ask our local libraries, our public libraries, our university libraries to, to order the book. So I do encourage you um, to do that and, and support the work in that way. So I will start by giving you a little bit of story behind this in terms of, because this is actually an interdisciplinary project, very much so. Um, so the way Zom Farm started actually, so it's, um, I, I never thought, I, I never thought of this work as a book actually, it, it was not initially written to be a book. Um, the multiple stories, the eight stories that are, are in it were initially written as separate spoken word pieces, because um, at the time I was doing quite a bit of spoken word and, um, and I was performing quite a bit in cabarets and open mics and stuff like that. And so those were, they were initially written as separate spoken word pieces um, around like anywhere between seven to 12 minutes that I would perform on different stages. And in 2016, I, I went on tour with my spoken word show. Um, and really what I had done then is I had put a body of my work together. I had put my favorite poems together. I gave it a title and I went on tour because, you know, I wanted to go on tour. I wanted to meet new audiences. And it was like a one woman spoken word show where it was just me on a stage with, um, you know, like a mic stand and, and that was it. And so then I came back from this tour uh, and it's when I came back from this tour that I realized for the first time that those stories that I had written separately, those spoken word pieces were actually, uh, like that's when I realized actually there's a storyline behind it, which I had never realized before. Like I didn't realize that there was actually like a beginning, like, you know, that I was actually narrating a story through all of those separate pieces. So when I realized this, and I learned when that happens, I like to, it, it, those moments, I like to say that those are moments where your body of work speaks back to you. It's almost like your body of work has an, is an entity and an identity of their own. And then that work speaks back to you and say, hey, you know, knock, knock, knock. Do you know? Do you realize? And, and, and suddenly there's like other storylines emerging, right? Like the, the work takes on like different levels of meaning. So that's what happened with the Zoom fam. I realized, oh, I'm actually telling a story there. And my concern um, when I was working on this or my, my interest when I was working on this was to, um, uh, I, like, you know, I developed the manuscript for a show. I developed the manuscript for stage. I did not develop the manuscript to be a book. Um, Cause I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put the spoken word pieces together and I'm gonna develop a show around it. And what I was interested in doing, I think this is a good time for me to share my screen actually, cause I'm gonna be showing you uh, some images of this. Um, yeah, uh, no, sorry. This is what I want to work on. Okay. 
uh, I'm assuming my screen is being shared right now. Uh, oops, where's my, uh, sorry. All right, sorry about that. Um, technology, there we go. Um, so yeah, so I was saying, so what I, when, when I developed this manuscript for the stage, um, what I was really interested in actually, um, I was, you know, cause I had done spoken word for so long. And as I said, it was, when I do spoken word, it's me with a mic stand on a stage and my voice really has to do pretty much everything. And I was really fascinated with the question. I wanted to know, I'm, as you might have guessed by now, I'm such a lover of poetry. And I really wanted to know what if poetry could move across a, straight, a stage? What if poetry could move through the body? What would that look like? And what would that feel like? What would that feel like for me as a performer? And what will that feel like for an audience also witnessing the piece? Um, so that was very much um, the, when I developed the manuscript uh, on stage for this piece, that was very much what I had in mind. And, and it became a very meaningful, at the same time, I'm like showing you some, how do I go to the next image? Oops. That's the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing you, maybe I will just do this to make this easier. There we go. Um, at, so at the same time, I was very much, um, uh, you know, as I was working on this, so much of this work is about ancestral healing. So much of this work is about like finding a language. So much of this poetry is about like finding a language with which to articulate like an ancestral and decolonial way of being, of being quote unquote transgender. Uh, transgender as being like a modern term that we use now. Um, and so then that quest of like, how does the poetry move through the body uh, also became a question of how then does the, the you know, like the, the decolonial and the ancestral utterance uh, of being otherly gendered express itself through the body. So that was really the, the, my, my major question. Uh, around this work. So I'm gonna show you some, those are some images of the performance. So what happened with the performance also, the performance has actually never been shown to an audience because it was supposed to premiere in April, 2020. And we all know what happened in March, 2020. <laughs> and uh, so I've, I've never had the opportunity yet to show um, this piece to an audience. I mean, a very select audience saw it, which was basically my, the team that was working with me on it. Uh, but I just wanted to show you some images of what what you heard right now as a spoken word piece, like what, um, you know, what different scenes of that piece look like um, on a stage. Um, and yeah, so the question has really been like, how do I dance this poetry? How do I embody uh, this poetry uh, on, on a stage uh, uh, across the body and across space? Um, so that was that was like the the question with working on the show. I'm gonna stop screen share for a second, and then when it came to, and then it's only at a later point then that I had to turn the manuscript uh, from a stage show into a book. That happened at a way later point uh, in the process, and what. I was interested in when I had to do this process, I was thinking through how do I then bring my performative practice and my visual arts practice into the textual work, right? Like the, 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 the physical object of the book, the literary object. So one of the things, so that, then I started thinking of the body of the text on the page. What if the body of the text could perform on the page in the same way that the body of the performer, so my body performs the poetry on the stage. So that's the particularity of this book because it's not laid out like a traditional book. I'm gonna show you um, some pages, uh, as to you know, like how the book is laid out, and that's very, uh, that's something that's very intentional uh, in that sense. Uh, you know, like in terms of how everything everything is laid out. Like I really thought about it as, and those are this is like where's my this is the the this is the part where Zumfam becomes a song uh, across the page. Um, 
And um, so, yeah, so, so everything, everything in the book in that sense is laid out like this in very, very intentional ways. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I encourage, of course, you, you can delve into this work as a spoken word piece. It's totally fine or as a show, or, but um, I think there's something interesting. I'm always very curious as to how people interact with the object and how the text, what's the interaction between the text and the object, knowing that, you know, like the text is laid out like this on a page, like how does it draw your eye and carry your eye? So there's this performative quality that I, I then brought into, into this work. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I will, um, in which order do I go? Let me just do a time check. Okay, maybe I'm going to go into talking more about uh, my process first, and then I will show you a video that's still uh, related to this work. So I'm going to share screen again. Uh, this one. Share. Okay, so in terms of that, so I use some farm as an example to delve into, into, into that question, but really what I'm doing, um, you know, like, so I, a, a bit later I will show you, because actually I have developed now, this is totally new work that I haven't even shown really, but I have like a series of video work now that I'm developing around this work. So what I'm really interested in in my work is what are the ways in which we can articulate like languages of decoloniality. Um, and I think in my own work, at least, is that it, this actually happens through intertextual and intertextual practices. And what I mean by this is I um, we live in a, in a colonial in a colonial world with colonial structures. And those colonial structures also include the gender binary, right? Like in terms of like that entire notion that there are only two genders. Like one of the things that's important to remember is that the gender binary was itself a colonial tool that was used to control different indigenous populations wherever that colonial contact happened, right? Like and across the world, and that includes for indigenous populations here on Turtle Island, you know, whether you're going to go to North Africa, whether you're going to go to South Asia, um, you know, and, and, and that's the case of Mauritius, which is why the, the book is called Zom Fam. There were historically in pre-colonial societies what we now call trans people, so gender non-conforming people who were part of those societies, right? Like what we, you know, like what now we now frame as like, let's say, two-spirit um, people here in, in Turtle Island, right? Like those were actually histories that have always existed. And it was really the, the gender binary came as a tool of, uh, of colonization or of that colonial moment. Um, and one of the things that I, I'm personally very interested in um, ancestrally is that like in, in my own cultures, and I think in many other cultures based on the research that I've done, uh, people who were trans, you know, I'm using trans between quotes, quote unquote trans, because like trans is like a modern term, but like, um, you know, so people who, who were trans were basically, um, you know, did not, what were, were, were a lot of times sacred in the communities, right? Like if you think of the Hitra communities in South Asia, for example, and they were sacred because they were neither men nor women. And they could also travel, right? They were they they were a spiritual conduit, right? Like they, they they could travel because they could travel across genders, and they could also travel between the spirit world and the human world. And they were always in that inter space, and that was really what I like to call their magic. That's where the magic was, um, in that sense. And and those were actually the spiritual leaders. They were the healers of their communities. Um, and there's something to me about being trans in that sense and moving away. I think for the longest time, I understood my own transness, my own trans identity through the lens, through a Western lens, which is like, you know, that, that medicalized um, and, and, and legalized narrative that says you're born in the wrong body and you need, we need to correct this through a medical intervention. We need to correct this through, uh, you know, a legal intervention and then so that you can then fit into the right body. Um, I'm not saying that people do not experience gender dysphoria. That's not what I'm saying. This is like, of course, people experience gender dysphoria. But what I'm critiquing here is that the trans narrative is framed to us as a singular narrative, as this one narrative, whereas there has been, uh, you know, which is also a Western narrative, whereas in pre-colonial societies across the world, there have been ways of existing uh, across genders. There have been ways of being trans that are not defined by this singular narrative. 
And I think for a while in my own personal experience, I was trying to fit into the narrative until I realized there's something that's not quite working. Um, there's something that's not actually not just not working for me. And that's when, and that all came part of like the ancestral quest and the ancestral history and, and, and the going back to Mauritius and hearing the stories from my parents. And that's why the, the book is called Zum Fam. Like it's a, that's why the title is in, in Creole, even if it's a book predominantly written in English, published in Canada. This was actually for me very important. It was actually a political statement of honoring other ways of being, ancestral ways of being. So within all that said, so the interspace then becomes so meaningful to me because I, what happens, you know, in that middle space, you're not in the colonial discipline, you're not in the strict discipline anymore. And I will add to this to the, 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 the interspace on a personal level also. Um, I realized with time, it's like I'm mixed race, both black and brown. My mother's family is from South Asia. My dad's from, family is from East Africa. I grew up in a family that was both Catholic and Hindu between two colonial languages and, and three ancestral languages. I'm Mauritian, but kind of on my way to becoming Canadian, uh, right? Like there's like, so, and, and I realized increasingly just like how, how much of this interspace of the inter that I occupy, um, but also how rich for me this interspace has become uh, over the years. Um, so I, I work in, in, in between the middle spaces. One of my concerns really in my work is creating what I call a counter memory for the future. And what I mean by um, creating a counter memory for the future is looking, so when I'm talking about, like, you know, there's a connection to the past. I've been talking about ancestral uh, healing and connections and histories in so many ways, there's a connection to the past. I personally do not believe that we can ever fully retrieve the past because the colonial intervention broke that. It broke when, you know, uh, Blair in the introduction, uh, when Blair was talking about the loss of languages, the ways of being, the loss of genders, the loss of spiritual practices, the multiple losses that happen. I don't think we can ever retrieve that fully, right? Like, because we are stuck in colonial silences. That's very much what Zumfam as a poetry collection is about. It's how, we, how do we delve into the silence, right? When historically so much has been erased, when we don't even have archives. So how we, do we get into, into that silence to allow an ancestral utterance? I don't think we can ever recreate the past fully. But I think that through the work of the imagination, and I think that's, that's what's fundamental as, as, as visionaries, as dreamers, as artists, as trans people who need to be reinventing the world, who are dreaming of a different world. And I think that there's that particularity where we can use the imagination to, I, I do think that our ancestors live in our DNA fundamentally. And I think it's the work of the imagination that can allow us to activate that past. And then once we activate that past in that connection to the past we're not only healing ourselves and the past but we're also healing the future and then we get to offer something else we get to offer a new way of being I mean an ancestral but also a hybrid new way of being to the future and that's what I think about as the counter memory for the future so it's a rewriting of the past in the present moment so that we offer a different archive uh, for the future um, it's always weird speaking on Zoom because I'm just like, I don't know if I'm making sense right now. <laughs> I don't have a live audience in front of me. I don't know if I'm going too fast, but I see a thumbs up. Okay, thank you for the thumbs up for those of you who put a thumbs up. Okay, it seems like it's, it's going well. Um, great, so I'm gonna keep going. So a counter memory for the future. Um, I'm gonna be, okay, I'm gonna shorten this talk a little bit because I real, I'm just being sensitive of like time. But, um, you know, like one of the, of the thinkers for me that has been very, very influential in thinking for the question of colonial silences has been Norbert Philip, who, who is a Trinidadian slash Canadian writer um, and poet who I love, love, love her work. And in one of her books, she tries her tongue. She talks about the re re reacquisition of power to create one's own I made, right? Like, so the recreation of the I outside of colonial silences. Um, it's something that I really, really um, 
really speaks to me and and that's the, and, and that's how i see the work of interdisciplinarity right like i work in multiple media that then allows me to rearticulate an eye a rearticulate a way of being not just of myself but of my history that i can then pass on to the next generations um you know that that is a a, a, a remodeling a rethinking of the colonial structures and and that includes the structures of disciplinarity right and a clear separation um those are two books from uh Nobuze philip because i want to shed a light on her work because she's amazing um she tries her tongue uh, was one of the most influential work for me to start thinking through how to speak uh, in a femme language and also how to speak uh, through colonial silences and zong is a wonderful, wonderful work, uh, which is about, uh, Zong was a slave ship where a hundred, they had, you know, long story short, it's a, they had basically thrown 150 slaves overboard uh, to drown them so that they could claim them uh, as as insurance when they get, once they get got to the Americas, because, you know, slaves were not considered people, they were considered goods. So they could be claimed as insurance. And all that lives of that case is the legal document, the one legal document. And what Nobuse Philip does with this work is she uses that one legal document and asks herself, how do we give voice to the drowned, right? Because when you're drowning, you can't even scream. And um, so that entire notion of working for colonial silences, that's why I'm spending some time on this. Nobuse Philippe was so influential on my own thinking. Um, so I do encourage you to like look, look into, uh, into her work as well, if that's something that's of interest. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna skip over this for the interest of time. Um, yes, I'm going to skip over this for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking like quite quickly now, just about like a few of my, because I like, you know, you, you've had a glimpse into the performance work, the poetry. So I'm just going to talk uh, quickly for a couple of projects and I'm going to show a short video, which is new work. Um, so this is from a project called Breaking the Promise of Tropical Emptiness, uh, Trans Subjectivity in the, in the Postcard. And um, this is a, a new, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, okay. um, this is a new, uh, um, sorry, it's not a new body of work. It, ish, I've started exhibiting it uh, a couple of years ago, but this is a, a series a photography series that I worked on uh, as I, I was going back home to Mauritius. And, um, one of the things that had really struck me when I went back was uh, basically I was I was quite fascinated with uh, the postcard as a colonial cultural artifact, right? Like is that the postcard is supposed to be this small object, this small visual object that has a long colonial history that is supposed to represent a space that is supposed to represent, a, you know, typically a particular colonial space. And I was quite amazed by how um, all the spaces like you know the framing of the island in postcards are always framed as being like terra nullius right like totally empty it's like an ex a space of like exoticism uh, that is meant to be consumed uh, you know where where if you have enough euros or enough dollars you get to come back and consume uh, this sort of like pristine state of nature and there's never any form of local subjectivity in um it, it, like portrayed, uh, portrayed in the work. So what I did with this work really is that I went back, uh, I went back home uh, to Mauritius, and um, you know, and across different spaces on the island, I recreated the cliches, those cliches of postcards, those postcard cliches, but uh, you know, keeping in mind, um, you know. Um, um, you know, like, but actually framing my body and not just any black brown body, but framing also a transgender body at the forefront of, of those, of those uh, postcard cliches. So really like, you know, like questioning, questioning that aesthetics, questioning uh, that framing of the island, that long colonial aesthetics. And so this exists as like, it's actually, this work is actually being exhibited at Artside uh, Gallery in Windsor at the moment. Uh, actually, be because things shut down in Ontario, it's actually an online exhibit right now. Maybe at a bit of time after the talk, I'll just put the link in the chat. If you want to look at the work, it's actually being, it's on the Artside website uh, right now because it's being exhibited in Windsor. Um, so I can share that with you uh, of, uh, a bit later uh, if you want to look at the work in more detail. 
but the one thing that I also wanted to say around this work was one of the things that I realized after the work was exhibited is that as I was working on this body of work, as I was working on these on these postcards, I um, this was also the time where I was actually writing uh, Zumfam. Uh, and, and it's only at a later point that I realized that as much as I was grappling through language in this poetry, right? Like as much as I was trying to find the languages of love that allow me to honor, uh, honor an ancestral decolonial way of being that is truly Mauritian, right? And, um, and I was like, you know, I was, I was working for the English and trying to unpack it. And it's only later on that I realized that this photography project, Breaking the Promise of Tropical Emptiness, was my way of doing the same work. It's just that I needed to move beyond language. And what this, this project did for me is that it allowed me to develop a visual language. It allowed me to move beyond the confines of English or French as colonial languages and to use the visual language and the body and the relationship between the body and the land as the fundamental space to, to, to allow a, 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 new, a gendered way of being, an ancestral gendered way of being to emerge. And increasingly so now, I realize that there's a spiritual space between the body and the land. Uh, that there's a spiritual space there. Again, it's the interspace, it's the middle space. And I think, and, and, and so that's something that I'm exploring in terms of my upcoming projects. Like what is the relationship between the body and the land and what form of decolonial enunciation can come out from this? Um, I think I'm gonna wrap up here so that we can, we have time for questions, but I'm just gonna show you one quick video before we end. Um, and uh, so this video is like, um, it's, it, it's a teaser more than anything, but one of the things that happened after my show was canceled last year, um, I started thinking through, you know, um, I started thinking, for, I had never worked with video before. Uh, but, you know, the Canada Arts Council had the digital, uh, digital original grant, which encouraged artists to make digital art. And I was like, let's try this. So what I started doing is I started exploring then moving from photography and ex started exploring through videography and movement. Like, what is it? So, um, you know, how can I translate this work, this show as a performance that can't happen? How can I then translate it into a new medium that brings together the performance, the poetry, the body, the queer body and nature and all of it? Um, so I'm gonna share a quick video with you, which is kind of like a teaser of this, just to give you a sense of this new work I'm developing. Share sound as well, share. teachers, healers, mentors, caregivers, and warrior women of history. and fighters who infuse the universe with love, rage, and magic.
uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> technology it took a second. I'm like, am I even like, am I muted or not? Uh, so yeah, so this was this was a new series that I'm developing, which is based around Zomfam. Uh, but like it's a new me, it's a new medium for me. I had never quite worked with video before. The videography is by uh, Alejandro de Leon, who's a Mexican Canadian um, video artist based here in Dejage in in Montreal. With whom I collaborated last summer. So so now I'm starting to yeah explore. Then you know if we how do we you know like I, I think I'm, I'm I'm increasingly interested in immersive environments. Like what does it mean to step into a form of decolonial poetry? What would that feel like? So I'm I'm really thinking for like oh what would what would like an immersive experience of this work look like? Um, so those, that's kind of like where where I'm at right now. I think I will wrap it here for now. So because I <laughs> I know we have some time. We have about like 25 minutes uh, for discussion left. Um, yeah, so uh, I will go through the, feel free to drop your comments in the chat, but I will also quickly go through and see what has been happening. Uh, thank you so much, Kema. That was, um, that was really beautiful and extremely generous. Um, yeah, thank you. Do, oh, we've got like many nice comments and questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Derek Biso, is that is that a question? It's kind of a comment. Um, Derek says it's it's so nice to hear about your work. Um, this gives a great understanding about the photographs, the power of embodiment and representation of it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm looking for the link. Oh, I think there it is. Uh, this is. I will drop the link to the exhibit at Artsite in the oh, chat. Yeah. Uh, if any of you want to check it out. Yeah, Derek, um, you're tuning in from Windsor, correct? Yes. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll open the, the floor for questions. Um, okay. I guess I, I have a question mm -hmm. maybe to, um, to, to start. Um, I'll try to keep it a little brief, but I was really interested in, um, in the, the conversation that you were having about a, a constructing like a counter memory for the future. And uh, I guess connected that to um, in, the, in the poem, uh, the, the person that you're, you're, you called Kun Kun. Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah, and I thought it was really beautiful, um, especially when you start talking about like how maybe Kun Kun has a lover, maybe, maybe she doesn't, like we don't know for sure, but, and it kind of like breaks this rupture of like, um, this is a person that, I, that I'm kind of imagining um, based on a story. And I guess I was really interested in this way that you're rewriting a history that's not sort of a verboten truth and one that sort of incorporates your mother's memory and your sort of flights of fancy. And, and I was thinking about the ways that like um, queer histories and femme history has, has always been kind of one that might incorporate stories and, and maybe even like gossip or sort of, um, you know, kind of an unofficial history that, that isn't in the archives, but yeah, I was wondering if you could maybe talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think there's absolutely, uh, kum kum actually, you're totally right. Like oh, kum -kum, it's, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, um, you know, it's it's one of the, I mean, the other part of my practice is that I actually have a community arts practice, right? Like I run a lot of mentorship programs, I look a, a lot with youth. And typically BIPOC queer trans youth a lot. And I've been doing that for like more than a decade now. And, and really Kum Kum became came out one of the exercises that I've done, probably when I run like the longer mentorship programs, that's a six month to a year, where we're delving into the question of ancestral healing. Because um, a lot of times there's that question of loss that that you know, get, gets us and that I had to deal with as well, you know, like it's not just like the people I'm working with who asked me about it and, and the question of the colonial silence and what is it that we don't have access to. And the way Kum Kum came about was actually in one of my workshops, I was like, you know, like, so, so I do a lot of guided meditations to be able to like uh, access particular sort of like ancestral visions and, and, and forces in the work. And, and that's how Kum Kum, Kum Kum, before I wrote Kum Kum, it was actually like I, so I had this entire exercise that I did around queer ancestry, queer and trans ancestries uh, with a group of youth that I was working with. And um, 
and then I did the exercise myself and I gave life to Kumkum uh, oh, wow. in that sense so, yeah and that's how I, I, I that's why how Kumkum came to me she came to me mm-hmm. <laughs> well maybe I invoked her but I think there's something you know like I, I like that's why the, the last word is like she has a lover but does she have a lover and I think there's always that mm-hmm. it's it, we're not set right like so, so much of the colonial structures that are imposed on us is about the yes and no the male or the female the the binary you know the discipline and the and and it doesn't that's why I'm so much more interested in the interspaces because they always open-ended right like kumkum gets to be reinvented kumkum gets to manifest herself in my life hopefully again in 20 years you know like you know like and and I think yeah I would love I love keep being able to keep that sort of um like o- open space to reinventing our archives and and for for the reinvention of the archive also not to necessarily come from the physical object right like because because there's that sense of the archives of like what is the physical object that's in the institution but so much of our stories are oral histories right so much of our stories are legend and gossip as you said right mm-hmm. like and and uh and, and that's also part of the archives and that that also gets passed from generation to generation so i think there's something for me that definitely appeals to me about that that goes against the notion of like here's the tangible object and here is the story that happened when you know when also our, our past themselves have been so fragmented um, for sure for sure yeah I just think it, it kind of opens it opens it up to uh, maybe like a history that that you know history feels a bit more fluid and, and we recognize that like that that story is maybe that's only one, that's only one sort of possible um, sort of reading of like of events, and so I think I think there's something kind of really beautiful about um, about these questions or about like um, you know Kumkum also having like maybe different names and different genders. Mm-hmm. And it, it was mm-hmm. it was it was just so lovely, and it was it was really beautiful to like um, just to be read to, like felt very cared for. It was lovely. Thank you. Um, Jess, yeah, Jess has a question. Um, Jess s- says, Hel- hello. Hi, lovely Kama. I'd love to know more about your tethers between making work now in a physical space, having performed in so many gatherings you curated in Montreal. How have you been navigating the art world proper as a poet in its pandemic overhaul and the violences that Canadian art holds how does that inform your creative lens in the postcard series? Ooh, it's a it's a multi-part question. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Jess. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm so happy Jess is here. Uh, and okay, so I'm sorry, I'm just reading for the question again, if that's okay. Um, you've been making work now in a physical space, having performed in so many gatherings you created in Montreal. How have you been navigating the art world proper as a poet in its pandemic overhaul and the violences? That- Canadian art force, does that inform your creative? Okay. Um, oh, where do I even go? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think in terms of, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot. I don't know, like, I think that, I don't know if that's going to be a weird thing to say, but I will just say it anyway. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot as how marginalized artists, right? And I know many of us are self-taught as in like, we didn't go into the institution. Like Jess, I know you're also one of those artists, right? Like we didn't get an arts education from like some fancy school or something like that. Not even from a small school. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy school. Didn't get the arts education. Um, and, And I've been thinking a lot of like the multiple ways in which for me at least, like I've created from a place of crisis and survival, right? Like historically, like I, you know, I, I, I've sure like there's a way in which now I have more of a career in the sense of like, you know, I'm earning my living from my art, which is true. And they, there are certain institutional doors that have been opened to me over the past few years. Um, but like his, for 10 years before any of that happened, like I was working in a totally grassroots way, right? And, and so much of my work had emerge from crisis, from limitations, from precarity. And I don't know, we're a, a year into the pandemic now and I like, you know, there's just, okay, I feel weird saying this, but really I feel like there's just like a, such a deep sense of resilience. Like, you know, there's a way in which, of course the pandemic is hitting everybody hard, but I feel 
I've been grieving so much for a year, right? Like I had to grieve this show on which I had worked on for five years and then got canceled just before it had, you know, it, it was about to go on stage. And I was telling Blair earlier about like how I had to grieve the other project in Mauritius. And, but there's something for me, I feel like there's something about the grieving that feels deeply familiar. And like there's something about, I can grieve this and reinvent myself because I've been doing this my entire life anyway. You know, like there's a bit of that sense of like, there's a way in which now, at least a year into the pandemic, where I feel this pandemic overhaul is not hitting me. Even if, of course, I'm letting go of a lot of things. There are a lot of things like I can't plan the future. Like, there's a lot of insecurity, but there's a way in which I feel um calm or resilient for lack of a better expression for it like there's a way in which I'm like this is you know like I think a lot of this Naira Wahid poem uh where I'm paraphrasing Naira Wahid here but where she says something to the effect of I do not pay attention to the world ending because for me the world has ended many times and got you know and and I woke up the next day and reinvented it or something I'm paraphrasing now uh, oh yeah, the world ended many times and then restarted the next day. And I think of how true that is to the experience of marginalized artists or marginalized people, generally speaking, like how many times have our world ended? And then, so I think in that sense for me, uh, at the same time, like, yeah, I think like I've been opening myself to the grief. Like I've been opening myself to like, I need to feel sad about those things, but then, you know, and then, but what emerges, right? Like once once a leaf dies of a plant, what is it that, that comes up? And I think for, for me right now, in a strange way, I am like, you know, like there's, I don't quite know what's emerging, but I can feel something emerging and that something came from, from the pandemic in that sense. Um, and then I think, uh, so that part in terms of like my relationship to the pandemic, I would say that's kind of where, where I'm at. Um, and then in terms of the uh, relationship, <laughs> the relationship to the institution, I mean, I think that hasn't quite changed, <laughs> you know, like in that sense, I'm just like, the only difference now is that like everybody is just like, come do an online, I think that's kind of like worse, actually, like the kind of like labor standards right now around artwork, because everyone's like, come, come do an online residency with us. Also, the other thing that's been happening right now, because suddenly all the art institutions have resources, right? And they're like, oh, we can't sell five exhibitions. Now we have that money. What are you gonna, what are we gonna do? And I don't know, all the call outs are like, here's a call out, come do an online residency with us for the next three months is due in two weeks, right? <laughs> like there's been so much of like those structures where I'm just like this labor thing, like, look, like, you know, like the, I feel there's like kind of like a bit of a relationship with artists right now. That's my sense where institutions are just like, we have money, you know, like let's just, people are begging for work anyway, because all our artists are in crisis so let's just give them like crumbs or you know let's like my sense of it is that the conditions are pretty bad in terms because everything is online so everything you're doing at home right now but then yeah the conditions of labor I'm like mm. so you're asking me to draw up an application within the next two weeks for a residency that I'm going to do in two months but I, I have other plans in life right like so I feel like there's the institutions are kind of like my sense of where it is expressing itself right now in terms of like, oh, all the artists are begging right now so we can just offer them anything, you know, like we, that's my sense of, that, that's my little bit of, of tea on all of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I just- thank you. thank you for coming online to like give a talk for us. <laughs> <laughs> Very grateful. Um, yeah, it's also, it's also like, a, it's also like a residency that you're going to do in your living room. Like a residency is usually about um, like maybe leaving the space that that was um, stressing you out or giving you grief to be somewhere else and focus on your work. And it's like, what if it's just the living room that's also your office now? And it's also your residency center now? It's like, it's kind of a lot. Exactly. And then for people who have, you know, like I don't have kids, but I'm like, if you're parenting, if you're like, you know, if you're caring for somebody else, like, you know, it's just like. <laughs> you're caring for those plants. There's so many um, Ray has a question. Um, this is, I feel so empowered by what Zonfam has become. It holds so much power in the decolonial and trans space. How are you finding the growth of all of Zonfam's aspects coming to balance together? Oh, thank you for this question. I, it, 
for me, the way I think about it is that, and that's not just Zung Fam, right? Like I've showed you a bit of the photography from Breaking the Promise of Tropical Emptiness. And like, I, I didn't go into my other work because I didn't quite have the time to go into like more of this. But for me, all of it emerges from the same concern. Like that's why I call it a body of work. All of it emerges from the same values, from the same, same concern in that sense, right? Like it's that question that I'm obsessing about, which is not just my work, right? Like it's also in my personal life in terms of my, my everyday spirituality, you know, like I, I'm somebody who's like very grounded in my spiritual practices on a day-to-day -day basis because I am thinking of that question of as, as a trans feminine person, how do I connect with my ancestry and who does, you know, who do I get to be in the world? Like what is, who is the human that I get to be in the world? Um, and, and that is in my everyday life just as much as it is in my artistic practice, right? And I feel it, what those multiple media, uh, that, that intermedia practice is allowing me, it, it is allowing me a, a form of exploration, uh, a deepening of the exploration and, and it's allowing me to tap into multiple spaces, right? Like it's allowing me to like, okay, how do I explore this question here? And, and what, like with the performance, it was so much about my body, right? Like it, like it was, you know, just like a, a simple example, like I've, I've never been a sporty person. Like I don't work out or anything like that. A year before my, my so in 20, 2019, in, the, in April 2019, I started running. I had never run in my entire life, right? Like I started running in April 2019 because I knew I had a show in April 2020 and it's a 90 minute solo where I'm dancing and I'm doing spoken word on stage and I'm alone, you know, like, and I was like, okay, I need to prepare my body. And just as much, and, and you know, and that's when I, I started changing my eating habits. I started like how I exercise, like I started changing all of this. And then my spiritual practice alongside this, because I'm like, if I'm going to be channeling for my body, I need to prepare for this, right? Like, so on the one hand, in my very personal life, I'm preparing my body, but that transforms then who I am at the same time that I'm doing this, which then transform my relationship to the work, right? And then the work takes on a different form. So it's a constant, you know, like it's, it's but I, I think about it all as a body of work, right? Like this is all my life's work. This is all a body of work. And, and, and I don't separate my personal life, my personal practice, who I am in my relationships, who I am in my everyday life, in my like tiny apartment. Um, or who, you know, who I am when you see me, you know, like when, when, when I'm making the work. For me, this is all part of like, you know, like the integrity of who I am, so to speak. Um, so that's how I see it. I feel like it's, it's kind of like it, it's an obsession that now I'm like massaging in, in different forms and, and new things, new things emerge uh, in, the, in the process. Oh, thank you for that amazing response, uh, Ray says. Very relatable and reassuring. Um, and Derek has a question, um, which I think is maybe you you started to touch on, maybe answer. Um, would you speak to the place of spirituality in your artistic practice? Yes. Uh, before I speak to this question, I just want to. I'm just going to go up a little bit because I think we skipped okay. that. But Hans oh. had also sent a question. Okay. I will just read it out and answer this, and then I'll go to Derek's question because I want to make sure. sure we don't skip it. So Hans okay. says, "Thank you so much for your time, Kama. I've been reading queer theory lately, and I find a recurring aspect of queer studies is its opposition to family, as family is a normative structure that disciplines queerness." but your work beautifully collapses this. I was wondering if you could speak about how you view, view queerness in relation to family. Thank you, Hans, for this question. I just wanted to make sure we don't skip it. So I was like, I'm gonna go to that first. Uh, thank you, Hans, for this question. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, thinking for the question of family, I think particularly for me, of course, that's cultural always based on your location. But so for me, I think about it like, yeah, in, in you know, in non-Western ways, right? Like and the, the relationship, like how family values express themselves, right? Like I grew up in a place where like, you know, a, a lot of families, you know, like my dad has eight siblings, my mom has five siblings, and they all grew up together with other uncles and cousins. And like, you know, like, they, um, you know, I came up from like a history where we had the, the extended family compound, right? Everybody lived together. So 
I think it's, and you know, and then in the West, there's that, this very individualized relationship to family. And I think it's important to think through, uh, you know, like, I don't think it's, it's just one narrative of like, which is typically what they give us, right? Like, and it's the same thing with religion, because I've been getting a lot of questions where people are like, how do you reconcile your own spirituality when religion have always been so, um, have historically rejected queerness, which is a question I've been getting a lot. And it's the same with family, right? Like, and I, and I think, you know, I, I think that's true for a lot of experiences, but I think it's only one experience. It's only one way of being. And what I do with Zomfam, uh, one of my, you know, I, when, when I mounted the show, which was in October last year, I, um, I did like a private show for five people because I could invite five people to be in the, we were in the middle of the second wave. And one of my closest friends, like basically after the show, after she saw it, she was like, what a love letter to your family. That's what she said. She was like, what a love letter you wrote to your family. She actually cried when she said this, which, you know, and, and that was what it was, you know, because I think it's, we, we could, we could say, you have been harmful to me, da 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 da. You you know, and we end it totally legit. If that's what you need to do, I'm not saying there's a way of doing this. But for me, there was the constant need for you know that searching of the language of love. And I'm not saying it was easy. It took many many years. And I think that's why this this work. That's why it was five years in the making, five years into writing and rewriting, because it was also five years of like trying to understand my fractured relationship with my family. And the thing about it is that however difficult and hard and extremely painful and very harmful it was to a certain extent, based on our skills and the ability that we had, we kept trying. My, my relationship is still complex with my family, but we keep trying, like there's a way. And sometimes there are breakthroughs. There, sometimes there are transformations. Sometimes there's the moment where my mother is like, you are some fam. Here is one of my saris, you should wear it, right? Like, so there's also been those moments of like, whoa, you know? So, and and fundamentally, yeah, I, 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 I want to, I, th I think a lot of kinship and, and relationship and how we relate and, and how as hurt people, we, we learn to, to like, you know, do we want to make, make space to still love, however messy that love can be? Um, and for, for me, I believe in it. Like, I don't think our queerness necessarily means that we exclude our parents entirely or our family entirely, uh, but also it's an individual choice. I also understand that for some people they're like, mm, I'm not ever going back there. That makes sense. But for me, but I don't think it's a, it's a trope, you know, I don't think it's a structural, like, I think it's way more nuanced than that. I don't think it's just like, this is what it is. I'm like, mm, no, I think there's more nuance within it. Um, so yeah and uh, um yeah and then to the place uh to to answer uh Derek's question about spirituality I mean as I said about it right like it, it's such a like it's an it's, it's taking like such an increasingly like increasingly I feel like the spirit is taking more space even in my own body and then in the space that I live and then in the um I I I think particularly now within the context of the pandemic and the ecological crisis in which we're living as well, right? Like, this is not just a pandemic, like, we're, like we, we, we're living at a moment, right? Like, we, we, I think we are actually at a very specific point right now. And I think this moment, that's what I had said a year ago when the pandemic hit us the first time. I said, this is the moment that is asking of us, every single one of us individually, and then us as a collective, whom do we want to be in the world, right? Like, I think this is the moment where we get to reevaluate our core values and to get to reevaluate how do we want to relate. And when I say relate, I say on the one hand, how do we want to relate with each other, but also how do we want to relate with the earth? Right, like uh, I started with the land knowledge and talking about the territories in terms of like we are living through an ecological crisis. How do we want to relate differently instead of just being in that sort of like transactional of like you know like I'm just going to be taking the resources? 
how do we want to relate di differently in our workplace? How do we want to relate differently as employers? How do we want to relate differently as the arts institution, you know, working with artists or whatever it is? How do we want to relate differently with each other in, in who we are, particularly in the context of a pandemic where the body of somebody else, the, the breathing of the somebody else becomes dangerous, right? Like, let's, for me, that was really, I was like, how do we rethink um, those relationships and I think for me because I did interrogate myself on that question and I thought about it a lot in terms of then of my trans identity as well and I was like what does it mean for me to be trans right now what does it mean for me to be trans during this pandemic what is my job as an artist what is my job as a poet why should I be an artist or a poet during this moment and this pandemic and I think for me that's when I was like I think the way the way that I want to show is a different way of connecting to the spirit because I think that's what we have lost over time. That's what we have lost through colo long colonial and capitalist histories is that we're no longer connected to other forces that move in us and that allow us to relate with others and allow us to relate to the earth. So for me, that's the, you know, like that, that's, that's, where, that, that's why spirituality has become so important increasingly more important for me in the past year because I think that is this is how at least for me I'm getting to rethink my relationship to the earth I'm getting to rethink my relationship to others and how I connect to the earth and how I then connect uh, to to others as well Well, oh, thank you. Um, and, uh, and from, from Hans, Hans uh, Luhan Torres also, uh, thank you for such an eloquent answer. I love your sorry fabric, fabric installation, trans affirmations. It is such a powerful work. And um, I think that was a, that was a really, um, really powerful and kind of beautiful maybe note to, uh, to end this on and, and uh, to sort of take those words with us and, uh, and really sort of uh, think through like what that what that might what that might look like in our in our lives like really thinking about what kind of person we each want to be um if there are are there any final thoughts or um i just want to say thank you thank you for having me uh first of all uh, uh thank you for sharing this space uh this evening it's such a delight and thank you again to cindy and christina who were our asl interpreters tonight uh, thank you for being here and for and for your work yeah thank you thank you so much kema and uh thank you thank you all for for joining us tonight please enjoy the rest of your evening and take care Bye, everyone.